In this lecture, I'm going to talk about deep neural networks for image classification. This will be a series of videos covering from the motivations that include the classification task and also how, uh, how can we go from regular methods that try to solve this problem by using what we call shallow approaches to deep approaches. I'm also going to talk about convolutional neural networks as well as the architectures that are currently used in the state of the art and finally guidelines for training. Let us start by posing this, um, this motivation as an example. Let's say we have a task that requires us to learn how to distinguish between two types of images. Images that are photographs taken from the desert and other ones that are there were, there were took from a beach um, landscape. So the objective here is, given annotated images, develop a model that is able to classify unseen images. I mean, images that only the computer will see, we're not, we, uh, not a human into one of those classes. So let's see two examples. So the image on the left hand side is an, an image from the desert and on the right hand side we have an image taken uh, at a beach. In order to do that it's uh, very hard to work with the actual pixels of the image. We already discussed that in the course and that is why we use features instead of the actual values of the pixels. And a feature is a set of values that are, that are extracted from images and that can be used to measure similarity and also dissimilarity between images. We talked about in previous lectures about um, color and texture descriptors, for example. In here, I'm going to show this simple example. So let us just take the image, quantize it to 64 colors, distinct colors. That means we are using only 6 bits per pixel. And then use the two most frequent colors as features. So basically we are computing the histogram and then taking the index of the two most frequent colors in that image as in using that as a descriptor. I'm doing that because it is basically a 2D feature so that we can plot it in a plane. So every image is now represented by a vector of two values so that when I plot them what I see is basically a set of points here in which the red circles are images from the desert and the blue triangles are images from the beach and as you can see here the axis goes from 0 to 63 that means we have 64 colors or different colors possible it looks like that this feature space is adequate for this task let's see what happens so now that we have a feature space that means a space in which we can compute the similarities between images, let us now define a classifier. Classifier is basically a model that is built using labeled examples, such as the ones we had. That means images for which the classes are known. Usually a human will assign classes for images. After we build the classifier, it should be able to predict the class of a new image that was not seen by a human. The simplest way to do that is by using a linear classifier. That means I'm, I'm going to draw a line that splits the feature space into two regions. In this case, we have two classes, so only two regions. In uh, everything that's below this line will be assigned to desert and above the line to beach. As you can see here, we, we don't have a perfect separation, linear separation in this case. 
So some circles, some red circles, are um, above the line, and but they they actually should be uh, below. Uh, why is that? This is what we call training error. This is because often examples used to build the classifier are seldom linearly separ separable. So it's very hard to have a feature space in which we can have all classes that can be distinguished by just drawing a line and then uh, using this line as a classifier. And we call that a training error. In this case we have three instances that were misclassified by the same model that was built using the examples. This is common. This is um, this is this is actually a, a uh, something that it it is expected to happen, especially in real in, in real world applications. So now that we train the model, it can then be used to predict or infer a class of new data. If I just plot here, uh, and it's, in this case it's a yellow square because I'm, I don't know the class what would be the class assigned well the class here is desert because it is this uh, this point lies below the line so this is what we are going to use uh, as a reference however how good really is this model in order to really assess that we use new data data that was not seen before in training time so this data should not be used to train or to learn the parameters of the classifier this is what we call the classifier error rate for test so we have to um, usually in experiments we have to separate a few instances in order to test uh, whether the classifier is good or not in this case I'm using 16 testing objects and as you see here I'm plotting it using a bold uh, a thick black um, border in the in the objects or in the, the points here so in this case we have some of the images that were correctly classified but many of them were not correctly classified classified in this case five of them were misclassified um, having and then a total accuracy that means the total number of um, the number of correct uh, correctly classified instances divided by the total or that in this case 16 it is basically 5 divided by 16 which is um, sorry not not 5 right so the, the correctly classified so 11 divided by 16 which is then 68 percent not that great right uh, for a machine this should be much higher in terms of accuracy so what did we um, how, how did we fail here what we did that we could do best in, instead of just um, having this um, the same pipeline of choices remember that we have uh, we, we choose color as a descriptor and then we use a linear classifier as a model to infer new classes so how, what um, you can pause the video in and think about how can we improve that well there's basically there, there are basically uh, two things here that we uh, we did we first choose the, the feature space and this we can change and then we can also change the classifier what we often see especially when uh, with people that uh, are not very um, experienced in, in this type of task is to change the classifier so we could for example try to draw a classifier that is not linear that is uh, more complex that has a boundary that uh, can draw um, curves for example so we can go from this place here and then and pass on here and here and so on and so forth so we can draw a very complex what we call um, decision boundary and then this could be done by using more complex functions uh, uh, with a, a 
for example, a polynomial with a very high um, degree. However, this may not be the correct choice because as we uh, can see by studying machine learning, in particular the statistical learning theory, the more complex the classifier is, the less we have guarantee that we are actually learning something. So we usually, wherever we can, we will try to improve the feature space. So usually a more um, complete pipeline for image recognition is like that. We have the image acquisition and we can change that. For example, we can uh, choose to acquire RGB images, but we can also uh, choose other ones uh, or, such as grayscale. We can choose different resolutions and quantizations um, as we already seen in the first lectures of this course. Then we can move and uh, perform pre-processing of the images. So this, is, this can be very useful. There are many studies that show that by using uh, gamma correction and other methods for, uh, for example, to smooth the image, this can improve a lot uh, in, in the other end of the pipeline, as we will see here. We can also, um, instead of using the original color space, RGB usually, make some kind of fusion to a single channel or also use another uh, color space, as we see um, HSV uh, and that there are other available. Then we can perform feature extraction using color, texture, borders, shape, uh, Fourier descriptors and so on. This will form a feature space and then we can also um, perform transformations in this feature space. We did not cover this type of transformations here in the course, but uh, you, can, you can try and uh, search for yourselves. Um, the many, there are many techniques such as uh, principal component analysis or PCA, which is very famous. But if you have the uh, labels, some, some labels available, you can also choose LDA, which is the linear discriminant discriminant analysis but are other uh, other methods as well so we can transform this feature space in order to improve it we can even select some of the features and uh, by importance and then finally at the last stage we will do recognition which can be classification but also regression clustering retrieval and so on and so forth so we have a whole pipeline here and the best we can uh, choose every one of those boxes uh, the result will be better as well so we don't uh, want to think just about the, uh, the recognition algorithm so the classification algorithm for example we can try and use very complex ones such as um, uh, random forests and sample methods uh, um, other boosting methods um, but this will probably won't help if we didn't make the correct choices that come earlier than that so in, in the history of computer vision usually um, the steps uh, just before um, the, the recognition were basically invented in this in this order so between the 70s and the 2000s, we had color, shape, and texture descriptors being used, widely used. And then we have the invention of scaling variant features, the, or SIFT, that became the state of the art and stayed in this position for a long time. Also appeared the histogram of gradients and also other texture descriptors um, shown to be really useful despite the success of SIFT such as the LBP that he studied before and then uh, the literature didn't show much improvement in the descriptors themselves but rather on the combination of them or, or how to um, use them 
by adapting it to the data and this became and um, this made the two methods here that I'm, I'm showing you that are bag of features that was inspired by bag of words and the spatial pyramid matching we have seen bag of features in the lecture in the previous lecture but not spatial pyramid matching because um, it's now that it's not um, much used anymore because of deep learning approaches but basically it performs a kind of like uh, of um, multi-resolution um, um, a multi-resolution processing over bag of features and then uh, for example we could choose to have a descriptor grid that means we can extract from different parts of the image LBP and SIFT let's say then we can use on the top of that a bag of features approach followed by spatial pyramid matching and followed by a classification algorithm this way there are many steps and parameters to be defined and the choice must um, sometimes is difficult and will depend on the application and then there was a breakthrough the first breakthrough was um, a very large data set and I think the most um, well-known is ImageNet ImageNet was an annotated data set with 1.4 million images nowadays it has much more than that but the challenge that made it famous had 1.4 million images with 1000 classes different classes of uh, objects and by having this we were able to train what were called deep neural networks that existed before but weren't very popular because there wasn't that much data available and also there wasn't computational power available with the use of CPUs there there one can just uh, goes up to some um, level of performance but by using graphical processing units that means GPUs people started to make this kind of processing really fast especially convolutions which is which something that we already talked about and then by using um, libraries that allowed to compute in parallel and on the graphical board mostly using for, use it for gaming um, previously but then when the researchers discovered that it was very useful for research as well uh, many deep what we call deep neural networks start to take over image classification basically every benchmark was uh, beat by such models maybe the first one to became very famous was AlexNet which had nine layers I'm going to describe that in detail later what is layers and what what are these networks composed of but now let us let us just focus on the general um, methods so the first one was AlexNet and with nine layers and because it had nine layers then it uh, was considered deep so because it has a depth that uh, started in this case here the first slice here is the input image and then it um, this image went through many transformations until the last one here very tiny bit here is the 1000 classes and that is um, that is why it's uh, considered a deep approach and then they discovered that by increasing depth we could uh, make it even better so two other networks were almost simu simultaneously proposed Google Net which is nowadays most known as Inception Network and the VGG Net. The Inception, the first version of Inception, had 22 layers, while VGG Net had two versions with 16 and 19 layers. And later, the residual networks, which started with 34 
layers but can have up to let's say uh, is usually uh, one 120 layers is a uh, is a version that is commonly used but there are versions that are up to 1000 layers which is really impressive so uh, as you can see here in every architecture we start on one end with the image and then the image went through a series of transformations that are represented by those layers I'm going to define later and then we finally have the the, the classification result previously so uh, so just to make sure we have a chronological order here AlexNet was published in 2012 and the residual networks in 2015 or 16 sorry uh, but later there were um, researchers working on that the the two methods there were that uh, I want to to highlight are the Yann Lecun Lenet from 1998 which was developed to recognize mostly handwritten digits and also letters from the alphabet but also um, earlier than that Neocognitrum from Fukushima in 1989 so we now have with those networks a new recognition pipeline this new recognition pipeline basically um, was responsible to found a new area that is uh, called feature learning or representation learning this is because after acquisition we have a whole pipeline that instead of having separate and we have to define them in separate ways we just do it um, all with a single model so everything that is from the image to the let's say classification we are not going to to define them we are not going to choose descriptors or pre-processing or feature extraction techniques or feature uh, transformation techniques we are going to use a neural network input the image to the neural network and then on the other end we are going to see the classification results how is that well that's what we are going to see in the next video